Um, it's my honor uh, to introduce the ninth annual Robert C. Barron Lecture here at the AAS this evening. This lecture is named for Bob Barron, who served as the chairman of the AAS Council from 1993 to 2003. Um, Bob is a man of many talents. He designed computers for the space program, he co-founded his own computer company, uh, and then, in witness of the true breadth of his interests, started a publishing company. Uh, Bob and his wife Charlotte, uh, who are both here tonight, we're delighted to have them, uh, have long been generous friends of AAS, where they've endowed two fellowships for creative and performing artists. Upon Bob's retirement from the chairmanship of the council, a group of his friends decided that a lecture given annually uh, in his honor by a distinguished member of the society would be an excellent way to honor Bob's service and recognize his intellectual curiosity. The premise of the Baron Lecture is to ask a writer of a particularly significant work of history to deliver a retrospective talk looking back on the book reflecting on the goals and purposes of the work at the time of its writing, as well as thinking about uh, how the book is held up and what it has to say today, which brings us to tonight's business. Uh, Patricia Nelson Limerick is the faculty director and chair of the board of the Center of the American West at the University of Colorado Boulder, uh, where she's also a professor of history. Uh, Patty graduated from the University of California in Santa Cruz, uh, received her PhD in American Studies from Yale University. From 1980 to 1984, she was, in the, she was an assistant professor of history at Harvard, but moved to Boulder in 1984 to join the History Department of Colorado, where she has taught since. Uh, Patty has received a number of awards and honors, uh, recognized the impact of a scholarship and commitment to teaching, including a MacArthur Fellowship in 1995, and the Hazel Barnes Prize, the University of Colorado's highest award for teaching and research in 2001. Um, she served as president of several professional organizations, as a guest columnist for the New York Times, has advised documentary and film projects, done two tours of the Pulitzer Nonfiction Jurist, as well as chairing the 2011 Pulitzer Jury in History. Um, but Patty is perhaps best known for the book that she's going to talk about this evening, which is celebrating an anniversary of its own. Legacy of Conquest, The Unbroken Past of the American West, was published 25 years ago in 1987, and it is no exaggeration to say that it is responsible for reshaping the field of Western history. One of the central texts of what came to be known as the New Western History, Legacy of Conquest, represented a key turning point in the way that Western history was written uh, and was thought of by other historians. As Patty noted in the preface to a reprint edition uh, of the book, scholars in 1987 were shocked to find a work of Western history that didn't contain references to either the Alamo or to Little Bighorn, um, which uh, for a long time were regarded as the main events of Western history. Uh, instead of uh, the emphasis Frederick Jackson Turner, back to your college history classes, placed in his frontier thesis on the impact the process of Westering had on white settlers from the East. Uh, Limerick's work charted a course that took more seriously the role of the physical environment of the West, uh, shaping the region and its history, and called attention to the fact that not only did people come to the West from all corners of the globe, not just from the Eastern United States, but also that the West wasn't exactly empty to start with. Legacy of Conquest demonstrated how the environmental characteristics of the West, combined with the ongoing dynamic of Anglo conquest, the Native Americans to define the history of the Trans Mississippi West. In fitting 19th century fashion, Patty has put a colon in her talk this evening, which is titled, Those Who Labor in the Archives Are the Chosen People of God, If Ever He Had a Chosen People, or How the Legacy of Conquest Could Have Been a Better Book If Its Author Had Spent a Season at the American Antiquarian Society. <laughs> We didn't pay her to put that in the title. Yeah. I can't think of a better way to start the society's third century. Please join me in welcoming Patty Lumber today. What a pleasure and honor. What a wonderful group to see here. Um, I wish I could stay for the bicentennial activities, but I have a speech I have to give in Colorado Springs on Saturday, so that's not going to work for staying here. So I shall have to plan to come for the 250th. I think that will be my hope to return for that. Um, I'm very grateful to, to uh, my hosts here today, to Jim Moran and Paul Erickson and Ellen Dunlop and many others of the staff. I'm, I'm really happy to be here because, well, we'll get to more why I'm happy to be here, especially my last 50 minutes are about how happy I would have been had I been here uh, earlier in my career. But my friends Gloria and Jack May have spent lots and lots of time here, and those are my um, well, Gloria is still my closest friend in Boulder, and Jack Maine was a wonderful friend. But their conversation, I had, I was so fortunate to have dined with them over and over and over and over again. And I don't know that there was an evening at their house where the American Antiquarian Society didn't come up. I think I always heard uh, an excellent story from here. And then my friend Barbara Sutler Hornby, who was the person who nominated me for membership, 
passed away a few years ago, the head of the Colorado Historical Society, so those would be two of many. And then a person I never met in my life, but I've heard so much about him that it's hard for me to think that I didn't know him. By the time I'm, it's just a living place, I'll probably be telling people about him and got confused about whether I knew him or not because I've heard so much about him. But Steve Botin, who, I, again, I never crossed paths with, but I had so many people speaking to me about him um, when he was alive and in his premature passing. So I think I'll be able to remember that I didn't know him, but there's a chance that the nice young people in the assisted living place will hear some stories about him as if I thought I actually, <laughs> actually knew him. And then, of course, there's Bob and Charlotte, Charlotte Barron. And Bob Barron and Charlotte Barron have been wonderful, wonderful friends in Colorado. Um, speaking of history of the book, without Bob Barron and Fulcrum Press, a manuscript called A Ditch in Time, The City, the West, and Water, would still be at this moment wending its way through the publishing process in <laughs> some university press. But instead, that book is out in the world, beloved by water utility managers, which is no small achievement but also more and more widely read by Western citizens who should know about where their water comes from. So that would be my most immediate out of many, many um, other occasions for being grateful to Bob and Charlotte Barron. So I am going to be speaking about uh, the 25th anniversary of the publication of The Legacy of Conquest, and I'm very aware that I'm on the occasion of the 200th anniversary of this extraordinary organization and institution. But I do feel that I can make my own tiny contribution of a key study to the history of the book in American culture. My, uh, but by the way, I don't know if this, if the, if this is a bad idea, um, you'll tell me soon. This is, the, this is the copy that I carried around when the book was published 25 years ago. And it has a few little things and passages that I thought I should read. And it's a printed piece of material. So it could be a contribution to the American Humane Society. It could be. It's the 25th anniversary. It's the author's copy carried around. Is that appropriate? Yes. 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 Oh, okay. Well, all right then. We'll have this. This. Uh, you can take the post-its out. So well, anyway, we can we can discuss that later. But I didn't think maybe speaking of making a contribution to the history of the book that I might actually be able to just contribute. That um, the story of this book is quite a rollicking adventure story. This is a publication, it looks a little bit mild mannered, it is mild mannered. It's a publication that set off a fevered round of intellectual scuffles and squabbles and hair raising interpersonal remarks, which was then followed by a surprisingly cheerful turn of the tide towards congeniality and common enterprise. This is not, I'm, I'll be very careful about saying this. Um, Public discourse in 2012 is not noticeable for that quality of congenial and congeniality and common enterprise. So I'm happy to be giving this talk because uh, on this particular season, I guess I'll call it our season, since the format that's called the presidential debate is not my for favorite form of human exchange. The form of human exchange where you simply try to talk over the other person, that's not my idea. But of a good exchange. So I'm happy to say that this is a story where people actually came to a very different form of con conduct after some initial uh, screeching and squabbling. Within four or five years after the publication of Legacy of Conquest, I began saying what I would still say, that I am ready to be placed as a, in a permanent exhibit in a diorama in, the natural, in a natural history museum. My vision of this diorama, uh, originally, and that's still my vision, that I would be placed in a chair in my study with books and papers distributed in a manner that bears an unnerving resemblance to a landscape after a natural disturbance, <laughs> a windstorm or an earthquake has come to hit the area. The di diorama is either its wall text or the little thing where you, where you listen to something in your uh, earphone would declare that Mallet in this exhibit was one of the few specimens, maybe the only absolutely settled and identified specimen of a very rare breed called a fully contented author. A writer who felt that her book had just as much impact as she hoped it might, and maybe even a little bit more, and received just as much attention as she had hoped. Uh, my dear friend in, in Denver, Kirk Johnson, has just been seized from the, the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and he's now the director of this muse uh, the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History, so I'm hoping that I might, uh, I don't actually think they're going to put this around it, but I've never had a friend in a high, place of high influence like that, so I'm hoping that. 
So while I'm really grateful to talk about this book, the opportunity to talk about this book, I still have to perform a moment scuffling and squirming because writers speaking about their own books are unavoidably at risk of seeming to be stricken with a bad case of authorial self-preoccupation and affliction for which there is no inoculation or immunization. D.H. Lawrence in Studies in Classic American Literature, fortunately I read this when I was a kid, so stayed with me. D.H. Lawrence says that, that when he hears a writer start to talk about my work, Lawrence says, my flesh grows tired on my bones. <laughs> When I was in graduate school, and this was very consequential for this book, I was incredibly fortunate to take C. Van Woodward's Southern History class. And because we were in C. Van Woodward's Southern History class, we had the, sitting in the room with us, we had the author of most of the, well not most, but many of the most influential books. And so I would say probably half of the reading list was by C. Van Woodward. Not out of arrogance on his part, but because those are books I had to read. Uh, to understand Southern history. So we were all in a terrible tangle that we never escaped from. We would be assigned individually to raise questions about the book we were discussing, and each of us would just plow into the same swamp. We would try to raise a question about the book, and we would say, did Professor Woodward, or did the author, or did you, we just we couldn't figure out how directly we should address him, we'd struggle with him. When I was having my own struggle on that occasion, Mr. Woodward said to me, Miss Nelson, we shall proceed as though the author were not present. <laughs> well, that's easier said than done. That's if you would leave the room, that might be possible, but with you here, it's an odd rule. Well, then another interesting conversation occurred with Mr. Woodward um, in that class because I think, I think we were discussing his biography of Tom Watson, which had come out, I think, in 1939, and we were discussing this in 1973. So we kept asking questions about his intention with this and his intention with that. And finally, he said, uh, I, I must tell you, he said, I no longer really feel as if I'm the author of this book. Well, I was 22 years old. I thought, oh, this poor old man, he doesn't realize it says C. Van Woodward on the cover here. How could he possibly have forgotten that he wrote the book? Um, but now I'm fully, within years of the legacy of conquest coming, coming out, I fully got that a person who bore my name, Patricia Nelson Limerick, wrote this book. And then that person receded away in time, but I still had to carry the burden of having the same name as that, as that person. So Mr. Woodward figured very much in encouraging me on this project, and I um, am glad to start with a couple of stories about him. He'll come back in, he'll come back in soon. Okay, now we get to the one unit of discomfort in our evening's discussion, which is, why in heaven's name did I not come here if I was teaching at Harvard for four years and if I was in New Haven for eight years? What was going on there? Uh, I don't think, I hope there's no one in the room who can look back at their youth and be struck by its consistent brilliance <laughs> that you were. I would be eager to meet you if that's uh, your story. But to have lived in such proximity I mean, I know I was very busy at Harvard, I know it was that, but for heaven's sake, that's just, it's just uncomfortable, and I have no, nothing to do but a shrug to offer as to what on earth came over that young person. Um, however, this book is, I think, important to your enterprise here, because the one thing that this author, who bears my name, was smart enough to know was how deeply and wildly in debt I was to people who had worked in archives. I was a synthesizer in some ways. I still am. I was, um, I'll get a little bit more to what I thought I was doing as a synthesizer. But I knew in this, every page in, a long, uh, in the footnotes and citations and bibliography, each of those, every square inch of that, is an acknowledgment of how much I relied on the labor of others in this, in this book. So I'm proud to see that this person of 19, well, I was finishing in 1986, the book came out in 87. The person in 1986 wrote this, By the nature of this book, I am most in debt to people I have never met, to historians and journalists whose work I have followed closely, but whose faces I have never seen. In the tradition of Western resource extraction, I have profited greatly from the labor of others. Thank you is a mild and inadequate expression for the hard work that produced the material I rely on here. So I am pleased to see several places where I was appropriately uh, and directly grateful and I, I think that's the question. 
governing my, uh, certainly my conclusion tonight, is could we, how do we enhance that relationship between the people who do original research and archives and the people who take the results, the monographs and the articles and build them into a, um, a larger structure? I think there is enormous benefit to society if we could improve that relationship. The, I was at a conference in 1990, my friend J. Anthony Lucas organized a conference on nonfiction, and I was there uh, with a bunch of really interesting people, journalists who had taken to writing history, uh, Nicholas Lemon and Tony Lucas himself and so on, and I was giving a talk at that and used a metaphor, which might not have been so well thought out, but I uh, was talking about that pattern by which academic historians find that journalists, people who do not have um, much academic training in history, write the books that people read the most about history. And I was trying to be uh, a lot more congenial than some academic historians are about that. But I still use this sentence, which I only remember because James Atlas was there and he quoted it in the New York Times Sunday Magazine a couple of weeks later. It's a sad fact of human consciousness that you forget you said something unless the New York Times quotes it and then you remember it. Um, but I said that, that the um, that academic historians were in the position of people, of a person who might pull up um, in a car, a car loaded with valuable gifts and presents in the back seat, leave the car running with the keys in the ignition, walk away, and then be surprised to see that someone had gotten in the car and driven it, driven it off. And so, as it turns out, I compared um, non-academics who write these popular books of history, I compared them to car thieves, which wasn't exactly what I thought, but all the journalists have thought about that instantly. So I think there is every reason to make the enterprise of synthesis and putting specialized studies into larger, larger pictures, uh, to make that more of an enterprise that comes out of the academic world and the scholarly world uh, than it does right now. Scholars who do archival research want and deserve every gesture of respect and gratitude. Scholars who draw on specialized studies to offer overviews of particular historical eras or areas should be scrupulous in making these gestures of respect and gratitude. To the best of our ability, scholars of every kind should design our relationship with synthesizers and the archival researchers so that both the specialist and the synthesizer recognize the value of their different forms of intellectual work to each other and their mutual um, dependence. And so we'll return to that. Uh, the conclusion. But now we're going to go for the adventure story, the tale of the legacy of conquest and its origins and its uh, coming together and then its fate out of the world. A, uh, occasion where I guess the world just seemed, the universe seemed to speak to me clearly about the opportunities and the dilemmas of the field of Western history occurred in 1979, in December of 1979. I went for a job interview with Harvard the Harvard History uh, Search Committee. And I was asked, I believe it was the first question in the interview, I had barely come in and sat down, and uh, Professor David Donald said to me, Patricia, we see here, you are a Western historian. Could you help us understand, why would you go into a backwater of a field like that? <laughs> so, I did not have a lot of hope of getting a job at Harvard. <laughs> so, really matter what happened next, but I thought, well, you know, really, I should give this a try. So I said as gently and pleasantly as I could, I said that I was a little bit surprised to hear Professor Donald asking that because uh, certainly there was not a lot of uncertainty over the fact that a principal cause of the Civil War was the question of expansion of slavery into the West. It was not directly over the presence of slavery in the South. And so how exactly he was uh, asking me this question when he would be so aware of the importance of Western expansion. And so I tried to be as gracious as I could be. But I did think, this isn't good news if David Donald is calling this a backwater of a field. Uh, as I then moved further into the field of Western history when I got out of graduate school, and I did get the job at, at Harvard, so I guess I was diplomatic in, uh, in that response. But when I first attended the Western History Association in 1983, I was disheartened to see that it was tiny. It was down to maybe 180, 190 people attending. It was just kind of shrinking as a place. I went to a session at the Western History Association that first visit, and the uh, poor soul, melancholy person who was speaking at the session, had done a survey, a phone survey of Western historians and found them to be 
disheartened and dismayed and worried about the status of the field. They had many stories about how when a Western historian retired, the department would say, well, we'll need to get somebody in an important field now that we can place them. So it was uh, a long moment. I had been protected by the excellent Howard Lamar, my advisor at Yale. I had not known how grim things were out there in the world, but it wasn't taking me long to figure that out. I had a conversation, and I, I think I'll conceal one name in this conversation. I told this story at the Denver Public Library, uh, no, excuse me, the Denver Art Museum, and the man whose name I'm going to conceal, his father-in-law was in the audience. And after I finished the talk, this man's father-in-law came up to me and he said, I knew who you were talking about. Oh, no, and he said, you're exactly right about my son-in-law's character, he said. Well, that's good, so here's the, stay out of that one, I guess. But, uh, but this, is, this is the story, and I, I, think I, I think Gordon Wood would be fine with my telling this story, because he was really just a participant in it, and not the perpetrator here. So this man, whose name I'm not going to mention, who's quite prominent in a field of American uh, history, I guess we'll call it that, um, he was going to be going to a southern university. He had taught at the University of Colorado, and he was, had received a job at a prestigious southern university, and he was very happy about that. Gordon Wood happened to be visiting. This is when I was just right at the start of writing Legacy, and uh, the man who was leaving for the Southern University said that he was so looking forward to the move, and he said as he would start, uh, he'd started reading Southern history and literature because he was going into that world. I said to him, and I really think I just was asking the question, I said, when you moved here to Boulder, Colorado, did you have to do a lot of reading in Western history and Western literature? And he laughed merrily at this silly idea. Was I thinking that he would have read Louis Lamore, a man of his sophistication? Uh, and Gordon Wood just sort of stood there and watched that in the middle of all. I wanted to ask him what he thought about that, that exchange. He did not join in the merriment, but other people in that conversation did think, this was probably 1984, 85, people thought I really had made a humorous joke that a serious scholar would have to read Western history and Western literature. So those were very motivating occasions for me. I really took uh, that to be a kind of renewable fuel to just think, hey, they think that about the American West, do they? We'll just try to do something that might um, cause them to back off. My first writing, publishing experience, right, first opportunities to write as a young person had been at the Riverside Press Enterprise, uh, the band in California office where I had written obituaries. So in a small town, uh, well, you just have to, big town or any town, big city, you, you'd have to learn as an obituary writer that you cannot jump the gun. That it is wrong to write an obituary for a person who has not yet departed. And yet, in a small town, there are temptations. There are moments for you. I also did the birth announcement, so I thought maybe I could do a uh, return or rebirth. So, so I, I'm very, very knowledgeable on the etiquette of when you should say that an obituary is appropriate, it should never be premature. It seemed to me I kept running into people who were saying that Western American history was dead or close to perishing. And that was really seeming to me to be a situation that needed correction, that needed challenge and correction. So that was the background for getting the idea to write Legacy. Um, but the occasion of deciding to write the book came on a very, very precise occasion. I had been invited. I was out of graduate school in 1980, and I got my first big invitation to speak at a public conference in the summer of 1981, the Sun Valley Conference on the American West that was annually occurring for maybe seven or eight years in a row. I arrived at the conference. Um, I think I will just take a second just to fill in the, the setting. Uh, we were in Haley, Idaho. It's a resort town. Ski season is overwhelming. But this was a summer conference. The hotel, I think, had been really um, short staff, and then suddenly had all these people coming in for the, for the conference. I got to the conference hotel. Uh, I discovered we were given roommates. It was so crowded we had to have roommates. I had a wonderful roommate, a very interesting person involved in conservation issues. And as she turned out the light about midnight, she said, um, I should tell you, I snore. Uh oh. <laughs> so, so I tried to get to sleep before she did. I did not succeed. I ended up um, seeing whether I could 
repose in the bathtub. I could not, um, <laughs> that's a cold surface there. So I ended up in the lobby all night. I just ran all night and was young. So, so I was pretty um, exhausted the next morning from being up all night. So I went into the restaurant where I joined a friend, um, Peter Decker, who wrote the book um, Fortunes and Failures on San Francisco Merchants. And I sat down with him and his wife and I thought, the one thing I will really need is some coffee. The waitress came by. But I should just give you one more. Uh, this is probably obvious. This is my first time out of graduate, graduate school, and I'm speaking at a major conference, and I want to make an impression. So the waitress comes by. I'm sitting there. She has a tray full of orange juice glasses. She's overwhelmed. There's too many people in the, in the restaurant. I hold out my cup and say, oh, if I could just trouble you for some coffee. She leans over to pour the coffee, the orange juice glasses cascade upon my head. And uh, Peter Decker and his wife, Dee Dee, jump up with their napkins and start dabbing in my clothing in my head. And everyone in the restaurant looks over and says, did you see what happened to the woman up there? So, well, I'm making an impression. Now I have everyone's attention. So that was how I started my day. I went to the first day sessions. That was not a history uh, session. And the first ones that were people dealing with the 1970s energy boom in the interior west that was just starting to wind down, though I'm not sure we fully recognize that. Then people talked about boom towns, about rapid expansion, overburdened towns, um, largely male population, the excitement and social troubles of a boom town. They did that for a day, and not one of them referred to Western American history and its rich set of tales about boom towns and overloaded um, infrastructure and so on. So I went back to my room that night and I threw out the speech that I had prepared and I wrote uh, a speech. This was going to be basically two nights without sleep, but I wrote a speech in which I said, there's some bad amnesia going on here. People seem to not be referring. They have current dilemmas. They don't uh, connect their current dilemmas to the Western past. This is troubling to watch. There are lessons in the past, or at least there's there's the recognition that we're not experiencing these things for the first time. Amnesia is very bad news for an individual, and we do not congratulate the individual with amnesia. We don't say, well, how great, every moment is fresh to you. That must be so pleasant to have such an adventure. Everyone in this room is fully on board with the role that history plays in getting a society out of that state of amnesia. So I said that in that speech that I gave the next morning, I said that someone should do for Western history what C. Van Woodward had done for Southern history of connect, uh, make a stronger set of understandings of how the Southern past had shaped the Southern present. What was great about that was that I spoke, I guess a little imprecisely, so that a number of people came up and asked me when my book would be out. And I tried to say, we were having a little confusion here. I, one year out of graduate school, this is a book that a very senior person should write, and yet there's something kind of pleasant about people hoping to buy a copy of an extreme fantasy, which is a totally batty fantasy. So that was the origin of, so I went back to, to Harvard. There were publishers who came to Harvard to see important figures, important historians, but who had to fill their afternoon, sometimes wandering the basement, speaking to the assistant professors in Robinson Hall. Uh, Arthur Wang of Hill and Wang came and visited with me. Ed Barber from W.W. Norton came. And I told them about this project that I was starting to think about. And this, I had the teeniest and tiniest of little itsy bitsy, much can scale bidding wars between Hill and Wang and W.W. Norton. I think we might have been talking about sums of $2,000 or something. Then. And that first for me was, whoa, this is really great. So. Now, another way of putting this whole story, though, which is as true as, and as important as everything I've just said about the background, was that the right moment for synthesis had arrived. People had been exerting themselves vigorously in this space and other spaces, like at the Huntington and the Bancroft. The um, critical mass of monographs and articles that needed a new framework in Western history, that critical mass had been reached. There was to see. Malcolm Gladwell's, um, it's not a phrase he owns, but he certainly has brought to our attention the tipping point. We were at a place where someone was probably going to seize this opportunity. And it was my extreme luck to have been born in 1951, to have gotten out of graduate school in 1980, to just arrive almost, I mean, I've never caught a train with such precision in my life of just coming out just at the right moment to take that opportunity. 
the old ideas of Western history, but really in some ways the idea, Frederick Jackson Turner's idea of the frontier, was not um, was not holding all of these new studies. It was the the paradox it seemed more and more to me was that people were saying the field was dead because it was so full of vitality, because so many studies were not fitting the old framework. The old model had been um, exploded with with fresh new studies, which is a curious time to declare that a field is dead just when it is overwhelmed with, with life and vitality. And of course, the old idea of synthesis is that each specialized study is a brick in a bigger structure. Everyone works on a topic and brings that in, and then that becomes a brick in this larger structure. But once you have a lot of bricks accumulated, how do they become a structure? Who will assess those bricks and figure out how they can come together in a larger pattern? Why did others not step forward to seize this opportunity? I think I have an answer to that, that synthesis is scary. You are venturing out of specialization. Yeah. Every paragraph you write, as you write it, you know there are at least 15, that would be a low number, of specialists and experts who are ready to pounce on that paragraph and find it tragically flawed and incomplete and in a distortion of a much more complicated subject. I had uh, several encounters with that fear, and I do not fault anyone for yielding to it because it's a very scary, scary moment. But I had signed my contract with Norton and I was, I was going um, down the road. I was incredibly lucky at Harvard to have a year of leave there. Bernard Bailey was a great and kind uh, supporter of my, of my intellectual undertaking in this book. So I had a year of intense reading and note taking, again, reading mostly secondary sources. And I had the most extraordinary uh, company while I was doing that. Frederick Jackson Turner's protege, Frederick Merck, had taught at Harvard for quite a number of years, several decades. So the succession was Frederick Jackson Turner, Frederick Merck, and then nobody teaching Western history, and then me. So that kind of goes to your mind um, in a way that humbles you more than, than uplifts you. And it was a, a, just a really excellent aspect of this that Lois Merck, Frederick Merck's widow was still with us, and she and I rode the bus. I got in Arlington, she got on in Belmont. And so I often had Turnerian talks with Mrs. Merck on the, on the bus, and everyone participated in those because Mrs. Merck was quite deaf. So to, to speak about Turner, we, we raised our voices, and there's a well-educated group of commuters there on that, on that bus. So then, I moved to Colorado in 1984, and that seemed, I was not happy about moving. I was so intent on not being turned down for tenure at Harvard that I was determined to move on. I went to Colorado. Um, I had been in conversational heaven at Harvard. I was on the faculty council. I had so many interesting friends in different areas. And there is a wonderful phase, and there's no way on earth that I would ever have been able to discipline myself to step away from those conversations and spend the time writing this book. So moving to Colorado was good because from conversational, um, the highest and most intense rate of conversation I've ever had in my life at, at Harvard, that just went silent. And people said a quick hello in the hallway to me, which seemed cruel, but, but kind, because that sent me back to my office thinking, well, I'll work on this. So I was very fortunate to go to uh, Colorado and to have that opportunity to concentrate and spend time in the company of this manuscript. I really had very few, uh, I didn't have to really have to feel so sad, but I really had very few friends. And so when the phone rang, there was a very good chance, since no one else called me, that it would be my editor, Ed Barber, that would scare me. And that would get me up to, <laughs> so every time the phone rang, oh no, it's Ed Barber, I better get another page down here. So, so that was very stimulating. And then, of course, it turns out in a way that I, I simply did not think about. If I had published this book out of Cambridge, Massachusetts, with an 02138 zip code, Westerners would have paid no attention to it. Westerners would have been mad that somebody from Harvard was trying to tell them about the reach of the way that this book has been out in the world in the West with all kinds of regular citizens reading it, thinking about it. That would not have worked out of out of power. It seems it's a silly prejudice. I, I, if you want that, if that's what you're thinking, but it turned out to be an enormous advantage to write this book um, in Colorado. So that is the 
story of its um, composition. I had a draft by the summer of 1985, revised that quite thoroughly by the summer of 1986. I had very close comments from the historian Richard White, who's down at Stanford, and Bill Cronin at the University of Wisconsin. They gave me many good comments. They gave me one, uh, I don't know what, just puzzling line of comment. They told me, both Bill and Richard told me, they denied this, but I have the document proves that that documents, they're very important in this, that proves that they did. <laughs> they said I had to choose between an academic audience or a public audience. I had to choose whether I would influence the training of graduate students or I would um, influence forest rangers with forest service. Um, and I just thought, I don't know that I can make that choice, and it turns out I didn't need to make that choice. But they gave me a bad couple of weeks of <laughs> trying to think, what will I do now? So the book uh, came out to no particular, well, 1987 was published. The New York Times Book Review did review it. It was not a very uh, energetic or lively or enthusiastic review. My editor, this, this is, of course, you get, you get the New York Times Book Review like five days before it came out of the stands if you're in the publishing world. My editor called me about this. He, read parts of the review and he said, well, Patty said, that's not so good a start. He said, I think you're going to have better luck with your next book. <laughs> <laughs> We're five days before its actual publication date. Why are we mourning at this stage? So, so and he was not a good prophet on that occasion because for various reasons that I, um, I might just reserve for the question and answer period, that, that initial start did not, um, actually, I'm going to tell stories about how it got kept up. Various things happened over the next couple of years that I certainly could not have planned and no publicist could have planned. I could not have encouraged, for instance, Kevin Costner to make the film Dances with Wolves. But Kevin Costner did make that. The Today Show, the Today Show decided that they should talk to a Western American historian and about that. And of course, as everyone remembers from that, it's really not a great advance in the understanding of Western history. It's just bad guys and good guys just change character. And but, but I did get on the Today Show for that, um, and maybe most consequentially, People Magazine sent a reporter to interview me. <laughs> and that was pretty funny because um, I'd already caught on the pattern that when, when a major news outlet wants to interview a Western American historian, they have you go outside and sit on a rock. <laughs> and if you say, I don't actually go out and sit on rocks that often. Okay, so, <laughs> going now, and then they ask if you have a cowboy hat and if you have a fringe leather jacket, and you say, well, I do, but I rarely wear them, uh, but then in no time at all, in the People Magazine article, there I am, out on the rock, <laughs> a cowboy hat and a fringe jacket. Um, but the interesting fact, and there's, there's just no fudging this, this is the great surprise of the whole experience, Vicki Bain, the People Magazine reporter, was great. She asked me questions that were on target. She had done her reading. And so the result is that a number of Western historians instantly started saying, that People Magazine article is a lot better than the book. It actually gets more better than the book. <laughs> so, but it, it's, I'm not sure I'm going to second that judgment, but, but it was a very good interview. And out of her pushing me, I got, um, I said, well, there are really four words that begin with C that are at the core of this, this book, and that has turned out to be a far more effective way of summary, summarizing the book. The introduction's fine, but it was nowhere near as precise. And those four words begin with C that put forward the major case I'm making in this book. The first one is continuity, that I was rejecting the end of the frontier as the great divide in the chronology of Western history, and instead asserting that most of the issues of the 19th century West continue to be unsettled and to be fought over in the 20th century. Um, and whether those were Indian land claims or Indian religious freedom or um, Indian water rights or whether it was the, the role of the federal government in administering um, public lands or issues of mining and the consequences of mining and how you live with the landscape after, after the boom is over in a mining area. All of those issues were just as much with us in the 20th century. There was more homesteading, more homesteading, uh, Homesteads filed on after 1890 than before, that just about every measure that you could think of to define an end of the frontier um, didn't quite work out. So that had troubled me. That was, of course, if we go back to Sun Valley at that conference, that was what troubled me, that so many of the people right in the midst of a boom 
of the 1970s had this just as an unexamined conviction that Western history, the history of the Old West, was back then, it was disconnected from the present. It didn't, it didn't have any power to illuminate our, our time. So this first C continuity was a very big thing for me to say, we have to put this story back together. Otherwise, we walk around blindsided by every event in our lives where it's a constant quarterback sack um, to have things coming at us without our understanding their origins. The second C was convergence, that instead of focusing, as, as uh, Mr. Turner did, on the westward movement of white men, we would certainly have them in the story, but we would also include the history of uh, the northward movement of Spanish-speaking people, the, the westward and southern movement of French Canadians, the eastward movement of Asian immigrants into the Pacific coast and into the interior, and of course the prior presence of Indian people. So rather than a place where we focused on just one population moving into that place, we would see the place as what it is in truth, one of the great meeting grounds of the planet where people converged from all directions. The third C was conquest, and there was a little bit of controversy over this and, uh, coming up here. The third C was to say that the word frontier, well, in fact, Mr. Turner in The Significance of the Frontier in American History in, 19, in 1893 had said, the term frontier is an elastic one and for our purposes does not need precise definition. <coughs> uh oh, <laughs> what are we, how will you know what we're talking about if we don't have that? So the word frontier seemed to me uh, unplaced, uh, un unclear in definition, while the word conquest that seemed much clearer to me. You have native people, you have an invading force, you have some struggles of, of uh, power and warfare, you also have intermarriage and a mixture of cultures, and out of that comes a redistribution of power. One reason I wanted, and said very clearly, I wanted to have conquest as the word structuring the historical process, describing the historical process, or characterizing it, was because that put Western American history and indeed the history of North America into a worldwide context of Europeans spreading out around the planet and entering the territory of other people and struggling for power there. And then the fourth C, complexity, we probably should have been able to skip, but it still seemed important that the issues, actions, encounters, and episodes in the American West and its history were just as complex and just as defiant of clear labels of good guys or bad guys or civilization or savagery. All of those labels took on the project of simplifying a far more complex situation. I had a, I didn't put it in the book, but I had a good time with this concept that um, I went around, in the, while I was writing the book, I would ask people who worked with the public waitresses and cab drivers and hotel clerks and so on, I would ask them what percentage of the human population is composed of jerks? And the um, answer is very There was one like, the man who, who installed the furnace in our house in Boulder who said 90 percent. <laughs> I think he might be skewing the results here by his own temperament. And then the lowest one was a cab driver in Washington. I asked him, uh, a car had just pulled right in front of us and cut us off, and I said, oh, what percentage are you composed of jerks? He said, 5%. I said, only 5%? He said, 5%, but they move around a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so, this complexity thing was just to say that the 15% rule, which was the most common estimate from, actually it was a little uncanny how many people came in and uh, estimated 15%. And not just that, but the 15% within all of us of that, those qualities, that, that that rule applied to Western history as well. Okay, I can see that I have made some bad choices in time allocation. So I will just, um, I started like at about 12 minutes after, is that? Thank you. Maybe 30 minutes, okay, so, okay, so I, I'm good because I just want to tell a little bit about the re reaction to this book and then get to the important part of the, uh, what I missed by not being here. Finish. So, boy, do I have a case study here in the history of the book in American culture. What a performance we all put on after this book's publication in 1987. A storm of commentary and controversy erupted. The quiet beginning of the New York Times Book Review, and then a year or two later we had a, a big conference in Santa Fe called Trails Toward a New Western History, covered by the Washington Post. 
the Washington Post guy said, oh, the New York Times, are, they're going to be sad they didn't get the story because they always get these stories ahead of us. And within a week, the New York Times guy had called and said, how come we didn't get the story before the Washington Post? Uh, the, the New York Times guy was a skier, so he was in the market for a reason to come to Boulder, Colorado, and then to Salt Lake City to interview Richard White and Peggy Pasco. So suddenly we were, there was an article in the New York Weekend, or the New York Times Weekend Review. There was a big article in the New York Times Sunday Magazine. Uh, newspaper writers were coming from all directions. People who were older Western historians who were not happy with this book or with um, my Enterprise. And I should, I should back up and remind you, I thought I was saying this field is not dead in a way that would make all Western historians say, yeah, you're right, people should not be saying it's dead. So I had, I had a, a kind of a batty notion that people were going to say, oh, it was so nice of you to do this, and well, that uh, to be universally true. The, some of the, the period of rough, I'll just call it, the, not rough writers, but rough rhetoricians or something that we had there for Spell, um, um, I'll leave out names. Um, one historian, a very prominent Western historian, maybe 20 years older than I, 25 years older, he said that he was starting, he told the LA Times, he was starting a fund to um, get donations to send me and Richard White back to Russia. <laughs> Never been to Russia, I don't know. It's really the joy of free trip, I guess, to uh, <laughs> Another man wrote an article. Um, referring to me as Stalinist, fascist, and deconstructionist. And if you think it's easy to be all three of those at once, <laughs> that could be a, a friend. A, this actually, I do consider him a friend, though. He was one of the wild attackers at this point, but he was, but still, I can still have him having dinner now and then. Uh, he, his angle was so funny and so wonderful. He was, again, 20 years older, and he would say to me, He'd say, I said everything you said before you said it. There's nothing original in this book. I said it before you said it. And then a second or two would pass, and he'd say, besides, everything you say is wrong. <laughs> Don't you have to choose one? I mean, you could say either one of those. But, so it was quite a time. Um, and I'm going to now shift to one or two of these very positive and pleasant stories. The American Antiquarian Society had a... Had a um, conference in 1991 at their annual event where they had three Western historians talk and then two others comment. And my, um, and a person named Mark Ridge, an AAS person, was, was quoted in that, or gave a presentation of that and appears in that collection. Mark Ridge um, makes quite a distinction in that piece from 1991 between what he calls serious historians and what he calls polemicists. And guess who I am in that <laughs> categorization. So he he was not um, welcoming me into the world of thinking about the big picture of Western history, and that didn't seem, I didn't know Mark Ridge very well, I so there are people here who knew him, and you'll be happy to know the story's going to take a good turn here, because it was uncomfortable to me. Uh, I did not, I was not a particular admirer of, of uh, Ray Allen Billington's Westward Expansion, his Ternary book from 1949, and Mark Ridge, of course, would come on as co-author, and he's a very close friend of Ray Allen Billington. So I just thought, well, he's just defending his friendships. But then, fortunately, somebody told me, I can't remember who it was, but somebody told me that Mark was really angry at me because I had quoted him out of context. And I thought, well, people have quoted me out of context a lot in this break. I, I became so enthusiastic when somebody quoted me accurately and condemned me and, and lamented my failings with that. But it was an accurate quotation. I thought, well, at least there's that. So, so I heard that Martin was mad because I had quoted something out of context from him, and I thought, I don't think I did that. But then I looked, and there was a place where I had taken a quotation out of the, the version of Westward Expansion that he and Billy Dean had co-authored right in there fifth edition or something, and I had um, left out some key words on one side. I just, start, I just started the quotation. The quotation was accurate, but I started it in the middle, and I simplified his point. I made him sound much more like he was ignoring the, um, the rough parts of the conquest of Indian people and had left out, well, anyway. So I saw that after this was brought to my attention. I saw what I had done, and I wrote him a letter of apology. Um, he wrote back a very gracious response, and we then took to having dinner together at conventions, which was very nice. 
And then we had one absolutely hilarious and wonderful occasion. And I say this because his remarks about me are in print and are permanent. And my, my unfortunate taking him out of context is in print too. And this is the backstory that you would not know if you weren't here with me now. So we were at the Western History Association uh, in the mid 1990s, and there was a session where a couple of younger scholars were attacking uh, the new orthodoxy, which would be me and Richard White, and they were quoting us out of context. So it was a big room, there's probably 200 people in the room, Margaret Ridge was there, I stood up and I said, and I was planning, what I was planning to say was, I asked myself if I have ever quoted others out of context as I feel I am being quoted now. And the next thing I was gonna say, and I answered myself and I said, yes, you have done that, and there's Margaret Ridge who you did it to. So that's my plan. I stand up and I say, I have asked myself, have I ever done to others what, is, uh, what I think is happening to me now? Have I ever quoted someone out of context? And before I could make my next statement, Mark Ridge shouts on the side and go, you sure have. <laughs> so I said, stop that. I was about to say that myself. Let me think myself. So anyway, so that was a very, very background story. And I think we considered ourselves very genuine friends from that. And there are several others of those stories, which I will not tell, but in this, in this time, because I do have another seven minutes or eight minutes, and then I will stop. The transition from being a young Turk to being an old bird, from being the young rebel to being the holder of orthodoxy was so rapid, it was astounding. I was um, feisty and um, looking out for opportunities to challenge authority, and then I was authority, and it was way too fast would have enjoyed being feisty a little bit longer, but then it turns out my circumstances had changed, and as I sometimes say, I went from being contentious and controversial to being congenial and collaborative almost overnight. And there actually have been many adventures and, and better adventures for me on that side of it. So, okay, so now I want to take um, to the topic of what I would have gained had I been here and how this book would have gained. In this book, as I take on the fact that people hold very powerful and difficult to challenge ideas about Western history that are not easy to verify in the actual historical record, as I take on the reality versus myth thing, I take it on, I think, in a particularly clumsy, I'll get rid of that myth sort of way. I shall challenge that myth and I will uh, push reality as far as we can document that and that will get us myth believers, that'll put them on, um, uh, that they'll lose. I think that to myself really as if I were a presidential candidate at a debate, just uh, pushing hard for my, my point of view. I, I'm not absolutely certain when I met Alan Taylor, but I've known him for a long time. And I know, I know his book, William Cooper's Town, Power and Persuasion of the Frontier of Early North America, and I know that his work here was very important in that book, and I also know that he said he was here just 10 days ago, so he, so I'm in his wake um, on that. So looking at that book and thinking about this talk, I thought, oh, it would have been nice if I had, <coughs> had the opportunity to think outside of my usual frame of reference and to have what Alan had in his mind, the, the story of Judge William Cooper, an important figure, a crucial figure, a kind of patriarch of settlement and um, American expansion, uh, well, British colonial expansion, and American expansion into the, into the New York area, and the father of James Fenimore Cooper, the great mythologizer of all that. What Alan does with that, based on resources that, that he found here and, and a few other places, but that is the kind of subtle, intricate, persuasive way of taking on myth and reality that this poor author who bears my name did not have. <laughs> Seeing how elegantly uh, Alan looks at the authentic and the imaginary, to use his terms, but frames it in a way so that you can see James Fenimore Cooper with this legacy from his father, this forceful founder, was unsuccessful in creating a fortune he could pass on to his descendants, how Cooper then shifted to the um, to writing that story and crafting and rearranging the story remarkably with incredible success. He was the only American author 
Um, uh, Taylor reminds us before 1850 to support his family primarily from his royalties. So to see his father take on the resources of a um, invaded and conquered land, and then to see the son take that on and turn it into a way to make a make a living, but to to see how much um, Cooper was himself well, so to use Al Taylor's phrase. James Fenimore Cooper enjoyed a mastery in his fiction, denied him in the real world. His frustrations with the outcome of westward expansion, in fact, could be turned into the energy for the writing of his myth. It is so much better than anything we did from that. And so but then I thought, now that's not working out chronologically, because now this book comes out in 1987. I completed writing in 1986. Alan didn't publish his book until 1995. What's going on there? So I wrote Alan Taylor and said, I have a big chronological problem going here. And Alan Taylor said to me what I wanted him to say, which is that he conceived of the idea for this book in 1986, just as I was finishing my book. So I can fault myself for not having talked to Alan, which is what I wanted to do. So, But whatever the exact timing, things that Alan did in this room reached me not in time to say that particular aspect of this book, so that even though I was not in this room, I, I have benefited from having such a friend with such a remarkable book. Uh, the power of, a, the second aspect of what I would have gained here, the power of material documents where you were not, uh, not scanned documents, not documents upon a screen, but where you were touching what the people of the past touched. I don't know that there's anything comparable to that for giving the people of their past their full reality of humanity. Um, the story, I sometimes tell to get this point, that there was a little boy who was taken to the Supreme Court by his father. He's sitting in the court. Um, it's very, very solemn. A fly comes into the room, buzzes around the room, lands on one of the justices' head. The justice brushes it off. The little boy grabs his father's arm, shakes his arm, and says, did you see that? Did you see that? One of them is alive. <laughs> believe in the full aliveness of the people of the past, it seems to me that the documents in this collection deliver that in a way that nothing reproduced or quoted is ever going to have. And I feel that this book lacks some of that uh, immediacy, some of that full power of the, of the human reality of the people of the past. Uh, the George Miles exhibit that's in the 1991 collection on the guides, um, guides to the West, so many of those documents just give you such a sense of a person needing that guide to the West and looking for that, for that guide. Um, and then I will say that I was also taken uh, back to Brian Roberts's book, which comes very directly from this, this collection, where the immediacy of the people of the past and the um, power of their expression to each other, how the people of the past express themselves to each other, how husbands address wives during the California gold rush, how they um, I, I think I had a passage or two of approaching that in legacy, and I could almost say that maybe I was, I was putting out an ad hoping that Brian Roberts would come and do this, but all I could do is really sort of hint at that. Uh, this, this book's passage, and it's such a great thing that you do. I'm very aware of the facts that, that he mentions here, and I was certainly aware of them when I was writing legacy, but the way that Brian, out of this collection, brings this into sharp focus. Um, okay, I know and knew at the time I was writing this that the Gold Rush created an extraordinary collection of written documents that all sorts of people who would never in their ordinary lives have sat down to write their stories were provoked into doing that. I never thought of those that literary activity in relationship to, as Brian says, the explosion of creative literature that has come to be called the American Renaissance the classic thing, uh, known in great writers, and the California Gold Rush as literary events. Um, well, okay. What is so striking about this literature, Brian Roberts says, is the frequency with which its accounts are well written. The Gold Rush was a good story. One reason it has remained a good story is the fact that many 49ers, as well-read men, knew how to imbue it with elements of adventure, romance, and sentiment. Well, yes, perhaps. It just it gave me a way of understanding those documents in ways that I did not have before. And then it gets, of course, to the power, central power of Brian's book, his tying of the California Gold Rush to the middle class. Sorry, I'm obsessed with that, but the term the middle class is so locked in our public discourse now in a very one-dimensional, unilluminated 
way. And so my dream, which is not going to happen, so don't get your hopes up, but, but uh, before the election, we don't have much time, but President Romney, excuse me, pardon, President Obama and Governor, uh, President Aspire Romney, they should read this book before they go around talking about the middle class. That's my thought. It's not going to happen, but it's an idea that they would use the word middle class with so much more resonance if they knew about the way middle class experience shape people's lives and goals. Um, the serendipity, the third aspect, the serendipity of going to, a, to an archive, um, archival collection and finding what you didn't know you wanted or needed to find, having your plans and outlines beneficially rattled by that. I think I didn't benefit from that experience uh, as much as I would. And I also think that I would have had less need if I had worked here to accent the uniqueness or distinctiveness of westward expansion in the Trans-Mississippi West and more capacity and tranquility and power in seeing the larger national and North American framework of British colonial expansion and early republic expansion in Trans-Mississippi. So, too bad. But, the recognition is there, and I, and I close just with the thought here that the punchline to all of this is that we are, as scholars, thinkers, readers, people uh, engaged with the past, we are interdependent. There is an uncanny and uncomfortable similarity, I would say, between the individualism of the self-reliant, self-determining scholar and the individualism of the movie Cowboy. Both of those demonstrate that individual, individualism has its limits when a scholar seems too certain of how, how his or her success has been his or her own solitary achievement. We're a little bit in the presence of John Wayne, paradoxically enough, in those moments. We are dependent on the labor of others, and others are dependent on us. Our intellectual property has borders and boundaries that are hard to fix, and that is as much a source of, of joy as it, in fact, there's no particular reason to see that as any source of sorrow. So, the American Antiquarian Society, in its everyday work, embodies that sense of community that relieves us all of that cowboy-like individualism of the scholar. Speaking of old Western figures, um, oh, I should say, I'm, I'm saying this also in the framework, that this is kind of a, um, in the late 1980s, I was out there saying that we were on the edge of a great renaissance in Western American history. That turned out to be true. There is so much original research and so many thought-provoking and innovative research-based articles and monographs that the time is ripe for another synthesis. It will not be me doing it, but I hope Hope it will be someone who indeed does better than I did and works in this in this archive as they prepare that that synthesis. Well, so a last story from the uh, classic um, tale of the old west in Virginia City, Nevada. There's a tale about an old prospector who went into a saloon and drank way too much, um, and was um, finally just just passed out and was well, not in good shape there. So his friends thought this is a wonderful opportunity for a practical joke. And they picked him up and they carried him up to the Virginia City graveyard and they laid him out next to a grave that was dug but not yet occupied. And it was the middle of the night and so they hid the bushes and they laid him out there and then they sat and watched. Well, as the sun came up, he woke up with some struggle and he looked at the sun, sat up, looked at the sun, he looked at the dug grave, and he looked back at the sun, and he was very puzzled, and then he suddenly said, I've got it, it's the day of resurrection, and I'm the first son of a gun out of the ground. <laughs> so, that's a kind of better late than never. I'm so glad to be here tonight, and I wish I had been here 30 years ago, and this book would show the effects of that if that were the case. So, thank you.